Whoa. <laughs> okay. Matches are dangerous. Good Shabbos! Good Shabbos! Friday at noon. Who's gonna tune in first? Where are you tuning in from? We love it when you tell us where you're tuning in from. Near, far, this continent, other continents. We love when people comment, whatever you're commenting, because it signals to Facebook we're doing something of value. But we also just like to know who's in the house and where you're tuning in from. It gives us that sense of community. It's so beautiful, especially as we're heading into Shabbos. Hello, Stephanie, who says Shabbat Shalom from Herndon, Virginia. You are the first to comment. Who else? Paula Schmidt-Klauser from Chicago. Patsy from snowy Vermont. Snowy Vermont. You know, we're just... Uh, we're so lucky here in LA, but it's not always the best luck, right? I mean, just that it's warm and sunny all year round. It's not so great. It really isn't. I'm not trying to be facetious here. It's nice to have the seasons and to enjoy the snow and then to see the buds coming back on the trees in the spring. That's beautiful too. Sorry, I'm a little late. Uh, that's why I don't commit to a time every day. I mentioned in the forum uh, a little earlier today when I shared the Good Shabbos meme, uh, if you're not getting that, make sure you're in the, the Accidental Talmudist Forum. Nina's going to uh, turn the, the title Accidental Talmudist Forum into a clickable link. Uh, then you're sure to get more of our notices. Uh, also, I send that out to sort of my, my, my friends who have, who have contact information with uh, through WhatsApp. So if you're on WhatsApp, uh, then private message us. Um, with your phone number and then I'll, I'll WhatsApp you and then you'll add my info to your contacts and then you can get the, the Good Shab is meme every Friday morning by WhatsApp. But anyway, I mentioned uh, when I shared it into the forum a little earlier that I try to do this AT daily at about 11 a.m. Pacific. I'm an hour late. Why? You know, you're going along, things are good, everything is nice and then the plumbing falls apart under your house. Okay, so, you know, that I accept. God had, God had a reason for me to have, you know, all the plumbing fall apart under our house, and thank goodness we know a, uh, you know, really excellent uh, plumbing organization here in LA, and, and these guys are on it, uh, and it's gonna be a big unexpected expense, and I could let that get me down, but you know what? The plumbing's got to get fixed. It needs to be done. What are we going to do? Cry over that. Uh, now it'll be done for the next decade, God willing, or maybe even more. So, okay, it'll be fixed. But you know, when the plumbing breaks, you realize that's something you take for granted, right? When the plumbing doesn't work, this thing you never thought about, suddenly you got to think about and how you're going to, you know, deal with your needs during the day until the thing is, gets fixed. And likewise, the plumbing of our bodies, right? And so that's why when we go to the bathroom in the morning or anytime during the day, we've talked about this before on the show, we say Asher Yatsar, right? And when we give thanks and we make a blessing after we go to the bathroom, that the one who creates the body with wisdom and fills the body with openings and passageways that we normally take for granted but it is revealed and known before the throne of glory that if but one of those passageways were to be ruptured or but one of those openings were to be blocked, it would be impossible to stand before the throne for even one moment. Blessed are you who creates wonders and who creates the body. Right? And so it's not a bad reminder uh, when, when plumbing problems go wrong with the house, you say, well, okay, it's only the house. Thank God the plumbing in the body is working, at least for today. All right, we are on Brachis 35. First tractate of the Talmud is Brachis. Today we open chapter six. We have been studying the sort of the philosophy and the construction of and the requirements of the daily recital of the Shema, accepting the yoke of heaven, and then the daily uh, 
prayer, what, three times a day, the Amidah, we say we've been talking about that. Now we move into, excuse me, blessings. And this tractate brachas means blessings. So this really is the tractate of blessings. And now we're going to study when, how, why we say blessings regarding, with relation to all kinds of things in our lives. And we start with food. At this point, you know, if we're observing Jews, we're very accustomed to the fact that before we eat foods, we say a blessing. Even Jews who are not very observant have surely seen uh, somebody recite Kiddush, the blessing before wine, or Motzi, the blessing before bread. But how do we get to those blessings? How are they different from other blessings? That's what we're going to be studying now in chapter 6. So let's get into it. Our sages begin with a Mishnah, right? I don't have to keep explaining this, but the Mishnah is that first compilation closed around 200 of the common era, the year 200. And then the Gemara is that next layer of commentary on the Mishnah, which gets closed around the year 600, let's say, 6700. Uh, so the Mishnah says that we say a blessing over all fruits. It starts with the blessing on fruits. Right? And this is for the fruit of the tree first. So when we eat an apple, we say, now I'm teaching it, so I'll say it with the name of God in it, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Pri HaEitz. I'm not eating a piece of fruit now. That would have been a blessing in vain, which we never do. Uh, but it's not a blessing in vain because I'm teaching it to you. Right? That's, that's the purpose of reciting it in that way. But there's an exception because if the, if the thing that we're eating comes from the fruit of the vine, not meaning grapes, grapes get that same blessing as an apple, but if those grapes are turned into wine, so now it's a special blessing, and I'm teaching it to you, Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Pri HaGafen, right? So that's the, the Kiddush blessing that we say. There's other blessings associated to it when we're actually sanctifying Shabbos as we move into Shabbos. But just for wine, that's the wine blessing. If we're talking about things that come out of the ground, whether it is leafy vegetables like lettuce, or a fruit that comes from the ground like a zucchini, or seeds that come from the ground that we eat like legumes, right? Like lentils and beans. Uh, so then we would say, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Halam Borei Pri right? Blessed are you, Lord, our God, rule of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the ground. And that would apply to grain, uh, except grain has a special blessing and bread has its own special blessing. Bread and wine have special status, okay? And we're gonna look, and as we go through this section of the, of the tractate, we'll start to understand why bread and wine have special status. But now, as we move into the Gemara, uh, our sages ask the first question, which is, wait a minute, the Mishnah moved into the topic of saying blessings on food and telling us what blessing we say for what kind of food, but it never established why do we say a blessing? Why are we required to say a blessing? From where do we derive that we are commanded to say a blessing before we eat? And so now the sages start to discuss that because they're always trying to root the laws for us in the Torah, right? So many laws are just direct, right? You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. You will not, you know, take a, a goat, a, a meat from a goat, and boil it in the milk uh, of a female goat, okay? So that's direct Torah law. But the fact that we don't eat milk and meat together, which is not said directly in the Torah, the sages derive from that commandment, and they are very careful in how they derive things. It's not willy-nilly. So now they've already, they live in a time where they're completely accustomed to saying blessings before they eat, but they say, well, well, just a second. We know we do that. We know it's the custom, but from where exactly is it derived in the Torah? And now they begin to have this discussion and they're actually going to attempt uh, to justify the, the, the requirement that we say blessing before we eat from four different sources, four, four different types of arguments, and they're gonna reject all four and then finally land on the fifth, which is the reasoning uh, that they'll use for this requirement going forward. 
So the first attempt to justify the requirement that we say a blessing before we eat is they look at a commandment that says, when we bring the fruit of the fourth year sapling to Jerusalem, we shall utter praises on it, right? Not just praise, but praises, plural. And from that they say, well, so what but the Torah means is that we say a blessing after we bring it and before, right? So before and after. We know that, by the way, that there's a commandment in the Torah that says, and we recite this when we make the grace after meals, uh, that you shall eat and be satisfied and bless the Lord your God. So it's a, it's a direct, revealed, open commandment that we say a blessing after we eat. What they're trying to derive now is where's the requirement from that we bless before we eat. So they look at these fourth year saplings. And so this is the law of the Orla. And in the land of Israel, when the temple stood in Jerusalem, you know, much of the economy was agriculture, right? Most people were involved in agriculture. So most people had farms, most people had land. They would grow different things on their land, but separating the plots because you don't mix different seeds, different kinds together. That's a whole other set of commandments we're not getting into now. But if they would plant fruit trees, so the fruit from a tree that's planted in its first three years is prohibited. You can't even eat fruit for the first three years. You just watch that tree grow for the first three years. In the fourth year, the fruit that grows on that tree becomes permitted, but only in a special way. It has the status of the second tithe, which means that you have to take that fruit to Jerusalem and eat it there. Right? So you can really be thankful and understand how you know, everything that grows out of the ground is a gift that we get from God. And to be really be connected to it, God gave us his commandment. You don't eat for the first three years of the life of a tree. And then in the fourth year, you take its fruits to Jerusalem. If it is unwieldy, you know, people were walking, poor people didn't have you know, wagons and stuff that they could carry. And maybe there was a lot of fruit. Maybe it was a real fertile tree. So you could sell the fruit uh, locally for money, but that money was consecrated and you had to take it to Jerusalem. You were going to use it for yourself. In Jerusalem, you would use the money that you got from selling that fruit on your farm to enjoy yourself in Jerusalem, but you had to take it to Jerusalem. Only exception, interesting, is grapes grown within one day's journey of Jerusalem they were prohibited from selling it. The sages prohibited people selling those grapes because within one day's journey, so figure it out, bring it to Jerusalem. And even if you can't eat all the grapes you bring, it's great because people will adorn the streets of Jerusalem with these offerings of fruit uh, from the fourth year vines. And so you can imagine that in the spring, as these grapes were coming in, or I guess in the summer, whenever grapes reach their uh, maturity, the necessary maturity, people were bringing them into Jerusalem. And there would be a period of time when the streets of Jerusalem were just, you know, just, just hung with fresh, beautiful grapes everywhere. You know, as, imagine what that looked like. It must have been gorgeous. Okay. Uh, but ultimately... Uh, ultimately, they reject this line of reasoning. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the technicalities of this. It just doesn't work, right? Like the, the, the idea of these praises before and after, actually the Torah had a reason to write plural for praises on those fruits. And we can't learn from that the requirement to make a blessing before. So the next attempt to justify uh, <clears throat> was that the, the laws of the Orla of the grapes and other fruit was a little different because grapes have this special status. As I was just talking about, they, they use in different ways, they lead to wine, uh, and we can't learn it, we can't learn out from that that we have a requirement to bless before. Then a better attempt was made and it said, well, if we bless food after we've eaten, when we're no longer hungry because we're satisfied, then all the more we should bless God for giving us the food before we eat it when we are still hungry. Like think how much we appreciate being given a plate of food when we're hungry, right? Like 
you know, imagine the family members hanging around the kitchen waiting. When's, that food? When's dinner going to be ready? When's dinner going to be ready? You know, when finally the plate of food is before you, you're so grateful to receive the plate, it would seem like all the more reason to bless it then if you even have a requirement to bless it afterward. But we don't make the blessings after food in the same way over all foods. A meal that includes bread in it gets the full grace after meals. Uh, other foods, you know, there's a bunch of foods that get a very short blessing after, excuse me, and a few foods like grain products uh, and grape products get like a, a very, you know, not, not the shortest blessing, but much shorter than the full grace after meals. And so this requirement that even though everything gets a kind of blessing afterward, it doesn't quite match up to make it a requirement uh, for going before. Plus these foods that have special status like bread and wine were also offered on the altar in the temple. Uh, but you know, fish was not offered on the altar and we're gonna make a blessing over fish. So it's like they're, they're not quite able to make the, 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 you know, the clean parallel, uh, nor the clean a fortiori argument to derive from that. So they move on. There are seven species uh, for which Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, is praised. They include grain and wine and pomegranates and olives. And so for these seven species, we have a special blessing that we say afterward and since we say it afterward all the more when we're satisfied all the more we should say it before when we're still hungry but then they argue yeah but being satisfied from some of these foods makes sense and from some it doesn't and yet we have that blessing and again it just doesn't quite work out i could go deeper into this exactly why these arguments are rejected but the point is that they're rejected and we're got a lot to cover so i'm not going to go exactly why if you want to get really into the Talmudic reasoning of this, you should read this page 35 of Brachas. But the point here is these arguments are all rejected. And so finally, they arrive at, it's not just uh, that we have to say a blessing because we're going to eat this food based on the idea that we say blessings after we've eaten foods. But in fact, we're not allowed to derive benefit from anything in this world, not just food, but from anything without saying a blessing, without being grateful for the benefit that we're getting from something that exists in this world as given to us by our maker. And if we derive benefit from something without making a blessing, it's like enjoying hectish, right? So hectish, is when the temple stood and you were gonna bring a sacrifice. Let's say you were gonna bring a, you know, a goat. You were gonna, you have a goat, it's a beautiful goat. You're so grateful uh, for everything that you've been given. And so you decide that you're gonna, you know, take this goat to Jerusalem and offer it on the altar. Or you need to bring such an offering because you've committed a, a sin or a major sin, uh, or it's a peace offering. The laws of offerings we're gonna spend a lot of time on you know, in a couple years when we get there. But the point is that if for whatever reason you decide you're gonna bring an animal as an offering, so then you set that animal aside, you consecrate it, right? And so the word holy, okay, which is the root of Kiddush and Kaddish and Kadosh, means set aside, means separate, right? Holiness in Hebrew means set aside. Set aside for what? For holiness, right? For, for, for God, for thanking God, to give to God, to praise God. Uh, or that God has separated and made something holy. Why? Because he loves it, because he cares for it, because he said that it's special. So when we set something aside from God, it becomes consecrated. Now that animal or that object has a special status and we are forbidden from deriving benefit from something that has been set aside for an, to be an offering in the temple. And what we're being told here is, everything in the world has been consecrated to heaven and it can become deconsecrated and available for our use. How? 
when we make a blessing, right? Until we make a blessing, until we express gratitude for it, it is not ours. It doesn't matter that we earn our salary and went to the supermarket and paid money for it and brought it home. It still doesn't become ours until we say the blessing and express gratitude for it. Isn't that gorgeous? Isn't that just a beautiful teaching? Now, they note, the sages note, there's a contradiction because in Psalm 24, it says everything on earth is the Lord's, right? Everything in heaven on earth belongs to the Lord. But in Psalm 115, I'm paraphrasing, it says that heaven is the Lord's, but everything on earth be, has been given to humans, to mankind. How do we resolve that contradiction? Rav Yehuda says, everything belongs to the Lord until we make a blessing over it. I mean, assuming that we really are its owner to begin with, we don't steal, just say, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna take that watermelon, I don't know who owns it, but now I'm gonna say a blessing and now it's mine. No, no, no. Assuming you already have legal ownership of it, you still don't have the right to eat it until you make that blessing and then it is given to you. And that's Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa says that if we don't make a blessing, it's not just that we're eating something that's consecrated to God. He says it's more, it's we're stealing from our parents. We are stealing from our parents. Why? Where is the verse that he takes that from? I just want to get it right here. Hold on a second. Uh, as it is stated, he's taking it from Proverbs, whoever robs his father and his mother and says it is no transgression, that person is the companion of a destroyer. And the phrase his father refers to none other than God, as it is stated, is he not your father who created you? Uh, and the phrase his mother refers to none other than the community of Israel. As it is stated, hear my son, the discipline of your father, and do not forsake the Torah of your mother. Right? So again, he's, he's drawing it metaphorically, but he's saying it's strong. It's a very strong metaphor that when we eat without making a blessing, it's like stealing from God and from our people. From God, we just established why from our people. Why is it stealing from our people? Because the community of Israel, right, it's not, it's not just a nation, it's more like a tribe and a family, right? And this idea uh, that when one, you know, when, when one member of the family acts in this kind of, you know, selfish and craven way, it diminishes everybody. And why is that important? As we learn when we're saying the Shema, as we were learning at the beginning of this tractate, right? When Israel behaves properly as a people, so then they have the promised land. But if it said, we were told that if we started to stray, and this was as a, as a, as a, not just as an individual, right? There are many individuals who sin and don't seem to be punished in this world. But if as a nation we become more and more wayward, then eventually it says God, Right? He will restrain the heavens and there will be no rain and the land will dry up and you will be forced out of the land. And that's not just talking about the weather and the agriculture. Eventually, right, the, the children of Israel, in ancient Israel, lost the land. They lost it the first time at the Babylonian exile and they lost the first temple. They were given a second chance. We had the second temple. It stood for another 400 years, more or less. And then our behavior just degraded and degraded and degraded as a community. And eventually, because of all these individual actions, eventually they added up that the nation had lost its, uh, its privilege of enjoying sovereignty over the land. And in the year 70, Rome came in, destroyed the second temple, and we are still in that long, long, long exile awaiting the third temple. So we want to sort of motivate ourselves, not only as individuals, to be, an indivi to be a person who is grateful to God for everything that we've been given, but also as a community. And that's why community meals are so important. That's why Shabbos dinner is so important, and all festival meals, and Passover seders, and I mean, just so much of Jewish life is around the dinner table, 
because that is the place where we say these blessings more than anywhere and where we express gratitude for everything that we've been given. And eventually, you know, hopefully like this whole people will get so accustomed to making these blessings and being thankful, you know, that we will earn the privilege of having the third temple restored. And indeed we have a teaching uh, that since the temple was destroyed, the altar, right, the divine presence which hovered around the temple and specifically at the altar where the offerings were given, now rests where? On the dinner table. The dinner table is the holiest place in the Jewish home. Something going on? Or you just have to go? <laughs> uh, and so, and then lastly, uh, oh, so Robert, Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa also says, uh, when you, you look at that contradiction, right? Everything belongs to God, but everything on earth has been given to mankind. So that's the difference between saying a blessing or not saying a blessing. Likewise, there is another contradiction in Deuteronomy. It says, you shall gather in your grain, your wine, and your oil. Right? This is right the passage we've been talking about, the second paragraph of the Shema. And if you will heed all my commandments and love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, uh, I will give you your grain, your wine, and your oil, and it's pro- the rain in its proper time, and you will gather in your grain, your wine, and your oil, right? You will gather in, like, your grain and wine and oil. The grain belongs to you. But in Hosea, it says, I will take my grain back. I will take my grain, right? How to resolve that contradiction? When the Jewish people do the will of God, the grain is theirs, when they violate that will over and over, over time. So eventually the Lord will take the grain back and it won't be yours and you'll have to suffer for it, right? And that's what ended up happening. From there, our sages move on. The the discussion moves forward. Uh, And now a question that's very dear to the sages of the Talmud is on this question of grain, gathering grain, and the work that is required to gather grain and to have sustenance and to eat. Okay, so if a person has to work really hard providing for himself and his family, especially if he has a large family, does that leave time for Torah study? Should, should, should Torah scholars especially find some other means of feeding themselves than having to do work because while they're working in the field, they're not reading Torah? So, you know, not, not surprisingly, there is a dispute on this question. So Ra- Ra- Rabbi Yishmael says, you do both. You study Torah, excuse me, and you work and earn a living. And you have to balance it out. Uh, but you should understand that the Torah study is the most important thing, is the priority. And even if you have to spend more time working than you spend on Torah study, know that you are arranging your life so that those precious hours you spend in Torah study can be regular and can be your, your, your joy. You know, you can take joy from them and you do them regularly. That's why one of the first questions we're asked when we die and arrive in heaven, the first question is, were you honest in business? So you're working, right? Were you honest in business? And the second question is, did you make regular hours of Torah study? Right? So according to Rabbi Yishmael, that works. That works perfectly. But uh, Rabbi Shimon ben Yohai says, no, if possible, you should spend all your time studying Torah and somehow your sustenance will arrange itself, either because you're rich already or you'll marry a girl with a rich father and he'll take care of you. Or maybe it's just for a period of your life when if it's at all possible, you should study Torah, you know, all the time, right? Instead of a job. And if you really commit to that, then somehow, you know, your sustenance will take care of itself. And the sages actually, generally speaking, reject that view. Abaye says, uh, you know, people who arrange to work and make a living, uh, invariably, they're going to, you know, have time to study Torah and they'll be successful in their Torah study. But people who don't arrange for themselves to make a living so that they can focus exclusively on Torah study, that lifestyle usually fails and then then they have to pick up the pieces, right? Um, So you have to make Torah a priority, but you also have to work. Rava would say, 
Busy yourselves, now this is an agricultural society, busy yourselves during the harvest season. For those two months, you know, when, when it's a really intense period of work on a farm, focus on that. Don't even go to the study hall. Be totally focused on arranging your sustenance and making as much money as you can and putting away as much food as you can so that the rest of the year you won't have to worry about it uh, and your mind will be free and you can really you know, focus on your Torah study. And indeed, we have a teaching. Uh, where'd he go? Of Rabba Bar Barchana, who said that Rabbi Yochanan said, in the name of Rabbi Yehuda, the son of Rabbi Eli. I'm being careful to sort of bring down this whole transmission uh, of names of who you know he's teaching in the name of, because this is a, a very big value. Uh, in the Torah world, right? That, that when you teach something that you learn from somebody, you mention their name, right? We also have a teaching, who is honored? One who honors others. When you bring down the name of somebody that you learned from, right? Of course, it's, it's a merit for them and it's a merit for you and it's a merit for all of Israel uh, because we give credit to learning. We really value learning uh, and it's just a, a really beautiful practice Whenever you learn something and then you give it over later, you know, say the name of who you learned it from. And since he probably did that to you, you know, see, see how many names in the chain you can recall uh, as you give it over later. It's, it, it's extra work, but it's worth it. So at any rate, Rabbi Barbar Khan has said that Rabbi Yochanan, uh, that Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Yehuda, the son of Rabbi Eli, Come and see that the later generations are not like the earlier generations. Rather, the latter generations are inferior to the earlier generations because the earlier generations made their Torah permanent and their work occasional. And this Torah study and that their work were both successful for them. However, the latter generations who made their work permanent and their Torah occasional Neither this nor that was successful for them, right? So there's definitely, I mean, obviously the sages are Torah scholars. They are engaged in Torah above all things. They know uh, that they're teaching both future Torah scholars and the people uh, who love Torah but aren't necessarily going to be studying it at their level or with their intensity or with their kind of commitment. They know that. But what they're saying is it is possible for everybody to prize Torah study, to understand how important it is and to arrange their lives so that they're enabling and hopefully performing Torah study. For some people, it's just not going to be realistic. So then you should donate uh, to organizations that promote and engage in Torah study. Even though you can't do Torah study all the time, when you support an organization that engages in Torah study, makes it available to others, then you're fulfilling your obligation. But even better, right, even better is to make at least five minutes a day or 10 minutes a day or an hour a day, whatever works for you, uh, so that you can learn for the sake of learning Torah. Because when you do that, it's the same as tithing, right? When, when, when you tithe, when you set aside a portion of your income to good causes, so God becomes your partner in your business. And likewise, when you arrange your life so that you're, commu you know, you're having time with God, both through prayer and study, prayers when we talk to God, Torah studies when God talks to us, uh, when you arrange those things on a regular basis, so your whole life kind of you know, jumps up to another level. It's like a quantum improvement in everything. And you start to see the gains and the benefits and the, the elevation of every part of your life doesn't mean that you're going to live in paradise, that your whole life is going to, your whole world is going to be converted into a Shangri-La, but you're going to acquire meaning in everything that you do. Uh, and, you know, if you are watching AT Daily right now, so you are engaging at this very moment in Torah study, learning with me, learning the words of our sages, and it's at, now it's daily, right? So this is daily. You make a commitment to watch this show daily, uh, you know. Amazing. It's amazing. It's going to elevate everything that you do. 
I didn't mean to make a pitch for our organization, but yes, we are a nonprofit. Yes, we promote Torah study around the world. Yes, you can donate to us. Uh, and that can be part of your partnership with God and giving away you know, part of the income that you tithe. We should be one of the organizations on your list. Um, and that's easy to do, donate.accidentaltalmudist.org. Uh, that is what we needed to teach today. So Shabbos is coming. Everybody should have a really beautiful Shabbos. The takeaway from today is simple. We don't take benefit from anything in this world and especially anything that we eat. We don't taste anything. We don't take benefit from anything without making a blessing first. Because if we do it without making a blessing, it's like stealing from God and from our community. But if we do make a blessing, Man, we're elevating that food into, into fuel for beautiful and holy living. We're, we're receiving that gift at that moment, and it makes us grateful. So let's make a l'chaim. We're going to make a drink to life, and we're going to make a little bracha, blessing over it. Oh, oh, my goodness. That's the end of that tequila. Okay. Here we go. So, and, and, and I like, by the way, to think about what it is that I'm eating and what was involved in bringing it here. So this is a lovely tequila. It came from an agave plant in Mexico, right? There was a farmer who grew it. The plant itself, tequila special because, you know, when you drink wine, so the wine came off the vine, the grape came off the vine and was made into wine, but the vine is still there. When you drink tequila, so the cactus was harvested and the plant, the, the agave, gave its life. It gave its heart to become the tequila. So I appreciate that the agave gave its heart so that it could eventually become this tequila by a craftsman who did a really good job with it. It was bottled. There were a lot of people involved in the ch chain of transmission, <laughs> bringing that tequila uh, from Mexico, across the border, trucks, transportation, into Los Angeles. You know, it was bottled. The people were involved in that. So many people involved, thankful to all of them. Eventually went to the BevMo here at Wilshire and La Brea. I bought it, I brought it home. I'm so grateful that I had a car to bring it home in. I'm grateful that I have an office to drink it in. I'm grateful that I can enjoy it with you, my holy brothers and sisters. And now I'm gonna make this L'chaim and I say the blessing. I'll say it in English first. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, by whose word everything comes into being. Baruch atah Adonai, lahinu melech haolam, shakon hiyeh b'divaro. Beautiful. All right. Let me just scan. Are there any questions that I can answer? Brian just asked, is there a sentiment that we should not mention name of others Obviously with gossip negative, but also in compliment uh, is Lushan Har. If so, how does that square with naming names regarding learning from? Oh, interesting. I was wondering where you were going with that, how <laughs> it connects to what we're doing today. Uh, yeah, so we try not to speak about others, uh, certainly not negatively. We don't gossip about people. Uh, but sometimes we don't even say what's going on with other people in the community in a positive way. But really because it could lead to becoming negative. You know, for instance, if we're standing with two people uh, and, you know, both are heavy set or both were heavy set, one of them has lost a lot of weight. And now I compliment the one who's lost a lot of weight. Good job. It's amazing. You lost so much weight. You look so good. But I do it in the presence of one who didn't lose weight. So maybe the one who didn't lose, you know, could be hurt by that. So that's the kind of thing we're careful about. However, Bringing down a Torah teaching in the name of someone who gave it to us, who's then reporting in the name of somebody that they learned it from, that's never Lashon Har. You don't need to worry about it. It's a beautiful practice uh, to teach something that you learned in the name of the person that you learned it from. Uh, Lynn Job says, I too love to think about all the chain of events that brought forth the blessing of anything coming into my possession. It's nice, right? It gives us a lot more appreciation. Thank you, Melissa, for your beautiful compliment uh, about the teaching. I really appreciate that. A lot of people watching from a lot of towns. 
Maury Yehudas Fishman is in the house, a great teacher in Boulder. Great to see you here. Uh-oh, there we go. Now it's scrolling. I don't see any other questions or comments, so that's good. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm sending you big love from LA. My plan, the Saturday night class, that's at a pretty regular time, right? So when I come out of Shabbos here on the West Coast, uh, what I'd like to try to do, if possible, is to read my page on Saturday afternoon, but then after Shabbos ends, i got to take notes on it, so I'm prepared to teach it to you. Uh, so, you know, probably like within one or two hours after Shabbat ends, uh, you know, maybe like 7.30 or 8 o'clock Pacific uh, tomorrow night should be ready. Of course, life happens. We have to go pick up our kids after Shabbos. They wander all over town, and then we go pick them up in the car because uh, their friends live in other neighborhoods. But, uh, you know, more or less within an hour or two after Shabbat ends, God willing, I'll be with you tomorrow night. Sending you lots of sweetness. Your Shabbat should be filled with meaning, health, joy, love, uplift. Uh, and as Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach said in the Friday meme that I shared earlier on the page, on Shabbat, something happens to the world the world becomes infinite again. May you experience that infinity as Shabbat sen sets in this evening.